But remember when Jesus sent them out, he said, I send you out as lamb among wolves. Demons are the spirits you deal with. Wolves are the people you face. I want to begin by applauding both our ministers and our deacons for committing themselves to and completing the course of training that was required of all of them to reach this finish line of licensing and ordination. And I need to share with you both as ministers of the gospel and as servants in our church that we weren't completely honest with you about the purpose of your training. Um, kind of like going to college, college doesn't really train you for your job. <laughs> college just makes sure you have the discipline and the ability to balance to show you're able to finish what you start. Amen. That the reality is, is that the minister and training program and the deacon and training program were never intended to give you all the tools you're going to need. Because now you begin what we, many of us who are adults, have experienced called on-the-job training. And you're going to learn more on the job than you did in the classroom. And we just want to be certain that you had the gumption to be able to stick through it when the going gets rough. Today, as you join the ranks of leaders and servants within our church and put on the mantle of minister and deacon, I want you to hear these words that Jesus speaks in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. In the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning in verse 17, there is a word that is so real and relevant for those who would seek to serve the Lord, those who would be faithful to the call of Christ, and those who would dare operate within the body of Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 17, then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I, I, I know everybody else is listening. I want to have a little conversation with my ministers and my deacons. I talk to you all from the thought, don't rejoice in that. In the late 1990s, the Barna Group, which studies trend in churches, suggested that we were on the precipice of an unprecedented era in megachurch. They argued that in the beginning of this century, we would see churches on the rise and on the grow. That more and more you would find common churches whose membership are in the thousands and whose budgets are in the millions. Churches whose multiple ministries are attractive to this generation, that the same way Walmart and Super Walmart has cornered the market, that large megachurches will become a one-stop shop for all ministry, and that they would find more and more members gathering in the large churches. And in the growth of megachurch, in the growth of places where people gather for multiple services, with multiple ministries and multiple thousands of members and multiple millions of dollars. The Barnard Group argued that there would be two very real challenges that large churches would face in this new era. The first was the message of its ministry. You will find that in this era of unprecedented growth in church, in the body of Christ, in the kingdom of God, that we have come to the fulfillment of Paul's prophetic and problematic warning to his son Timothy. We said that the era would come when people would not endure sound doctrine, but rather itch, reap up for themselves those with itching ears 
And I want to speak to you who dare call yourself minister, reverend, preacher, that there will be multiple temptations along this journey to develop an itching ear theology, to preach that which sounds good, to preach that which gives an easy shout and an amen, to preach that which is easy to digest and lacks depth and the theological wrestling and the biblical exegesis that is necessary to grow and develop people in the Word of God. And as you take on this title of minister, I want to remind you that we can ill afford to abandon the orthodox doctrine of our faith that declares Jesus Christ and him alone is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but by him. We don't need any itching ear preachers. What we need are those who are not ashamed to declare that there's no other name given whereby you can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Those who hold fast to God's word is infallible, inerrant, and sufficient. That we need no other doctrine, we need no other theology. All we need to preach is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that is what we stand in need of. The first challenge we face is in the message of our ministry to be certain that we stand fast to that faith in our Lord and our Savior, Jesus our Christ. But the second challenge that a large church faces in this millennial area of mega ministry are the characters of the leaders that operate within the body of Christ. You'll find that the New Testament model of church, which plays itself out in Acts chapter 6, which you ain't know very well, suggests that a problem arose in the early church, and the apostles recognized that we needed deacons to help us solve the problem. That the New Testament model says that at a bare minimum requirement, for a church to operate effectively, it needs preachers and deacons. Those who preach the word and those who do the work. Now, now as church grows, other offices become necessary. Can't function without trustees at this level. Can't operate at this level without ministry leaders and, and discipleship group presidents. But, but at a bare minimum... It's not a New Testament church if you don't have preachers and you don't have deacons. And they are not in competition, but cooperation. <laughs> They're not seeking their own gain, but rather to ensure God is glorified. That it's not about our fame, it's about our faithfulness. And that God can never be glorified when there's a schism in leadership in the body of Christ that is caused by the poor character of its leaders. And in a situation where church is favored and, and growing and has multiple services and multiple ministries and multiple thousands of members and multiple millions of dollars, what we need most are leaders who have some level of immunity from the trappings of mega success. We, we, we need, Dr. Smith, leaders who can see strong programs and yet not be afraid of the day of small beginnings when something is initiated and only a handful of folks show up. We need leaders who, like that shepherd, will leave 99 to track down one. Because one is just as valuable as multiple thousands. We need leaders who, who as Ecclesiastes say, don't observe the wind to figure out when they'll sow seed. Because you don't wait for perfect conditions to step out of the boat and recognize that we walk by faith and not by sight. We need those who serve and, and acknowledge that, that a noonday devotional is just as important as a 10 a.m. worship service. Those who recognize that 
that, that I don't want to be known, I want to be faithful. And that ministry is not about getting a reserved seat in the sanctuary on Sunday morning, but about being out and about doing the real work of the Lord. And so as today you drink from the dangerous, self-aggrandizing cup of ministry success, as you put a new title on the front of your name, as you stand and have the ego-feeding applause of a congregation that calls and claps your name, I want you to remember these words of Jesus, who told some similar folk, don't rejoice in that. Remember, Jesus has been preparing his disciples for ministry on the other side of Calvary. He knows he won't be with them long, and he's got to be certain that these 12 and the others are able to, to lead and preach and proclaim. And so in chapter 9, he has given them some words of wisdom about the cost of servant leadership. He tells them, listen, listen, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but when you serve the Lord God, Sometimes you don't get all of that. He lets them know that there are some moments when the dead got to bury the dead because you got to sacrifice what you want to do for what you're called to do. He tells them any man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit to serve in the kingdom of God because you can't rest on past success when there's future work to be done. Bible says that after giving them those lessons, he gathers those 12 disciples and adds 70 more to them. And he gives them some parting instructions as he sends them out to preach and to serve. He says, listen, I want to give you three things to hold on to. Number one, if folk reject you, brush the dirt off. He says, and number two, while you're out and about, don't do this for gain and money, but let the Lord reward you. And then he gives them a word that, that's shocking. He says, Judy, and know this, I'm sending you out as lamb among wolves. Sends them out. They go out and they preach. They lay hands on folk. They serve communion. They have business meetings. They preach the word of God. They visit the sick. And they come back to Jesus in verse 17. And ministry has been a success to them. They come back bragging and boasting and saying, Lord, even the demons were subject unto us. That we laid hands on the sick and they were healed. We preached sermons and folks shouted. We taught the word of God and lives were changed. All right. People remembered our name. We, we sat on the front pew. We, we were on camera that, that we were the face of our church. And Jesus says to them, don't rejoice in all that. I want to suggest to you, you're going to have some moments of great success in the calling God has given you. You're going to visit folk in the hospital, and when you walk in the room, their face is going to lighten up. You're going to visit those sick and shut in, and they're not going to let you leave in five minutes. You're going to be there for hours. Some current deacon ought to say amen. You, you, you're going to preach, and someone's going to tell you in the back that that was the best sermon they ever heard. You're going to have some great moments. And in those moments, I want you to remember what Jesus said. Don't rejoice in all that. He says, rejoice rather that your name is written in heaven. Now, now, now y'all be asking, why does Jesus tell us not to rejoice? It seems that that's what we do. And we ought to take joy in success in ministry. 
Jesus said, listen, don't rejoice that demons are subject to you. The word subject that, that these disciples use is this, this Greek term, hupotasso, and it literally means to be subject to, that, that, that demons have voluntarily surrendered to us. And, and the implication is that you didn't take authority over them, they just surrendered to you. Now, 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 that's important because if you remember Luke chapter 9, a, a brother brings his son to his apostles and says to these disciples, my son is sick and the disciples were not able to cast demons out. And, and Jesus said, listen, listen, don't, don't, don't rejoice in the fact that demons surrender to you because they don't always do that. One chapter earlier, it didn't go down that way. Can, can, can I preach? Is that all right? Curtis, let me preach. He, 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 he says, listen, listen. The disciples came back talking about demons are subject to us. But remember when Jesus sent them out, he said, I send you out as lamb among wolves. Demons are the spirits you deal with. Wolves are the people you face. <laughs> you, you, the demons surrendered for a little while, but you still got some. Now, now, now you're quiet because there's something about wolves you don't know. Wolves are untamable. You've seen lions, tigers, bears in a circus. But you ain't never seen wolves. Y'all, wolves ain't even at the zoo. Because wolves are mean. Wolves are nasty. Wolves will bite you. Can I tell you the worst part about wolves? They're never alone. They run in packs and cliques and ministries. And the sad reality is that church is full of packs of wolves and temperamental demons who will surrender every now and then, but they know how to bite back. And maybe Jesus says, don't rejoice in those momentary moments of success because it ain't always going to be like that. You're going to preach and ain't nobody going to say amen. You're going to serve, and they still going to cuss you out. You're going to be faithful, and you won't be rewarded. And Jesus said, listen, the temptation of the enemy is to be, get you to become so addicted to those momentary moments of success that you now become dysfunctional when you realize they're still wolves. And I need you to be able to serve when nobody's clapping. I need you to be faithful over the gospel when only three folks show up. I need you to show up at the hospital when the family doesn't want to see your face. I need to know that you can carry out this assignment when people don't appreciate you, don't love you, don't pat you on the back, won't stand and clap because you know it was never going to be like that anyway. Somebody say, watch them wolves. So Jesus said, listen, listen, that stuff won't always be like that. So let me give you something else to rejoice in. The fact that your name is written in heaven. That, that, that you've got a home over in glory. 
that you're not doing this for the applause of people, but that when you stand before your maker, he will say to you, well done. This task is not always as glorious as it looks. There are multiple mean moments. And if you don't know that you have a greater reward, you'll tear that license up and walk away. If you're not certain that there's another reason you serve, you'll say to But when you know you've got another reward, it'll give you some perseverance when you're dealing with wolves. When you know that God is pleased, it, it'll give you some thick skin when you're dealing with demons. When you know that you do this to serve the Lord, it, it will give you some stick to itness when the journey is not as pleasing as it is today. I, I got a funny feeling that every day of ministry ain't going to look like today. Jesus says, don't rejoice in all of this, but rather that your name is written in heaven. And, and when he says, your name is written in heaven, th th that is a reference to the status of your salvation. Remember that before you were a minister, you were a disciple. Before you were a deacon, you were a Christian. And don't allow the new title on your name to overwhelm your discipleship and your Christianity. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm almost done now. Look, look. D Dr. Bernard Richardson from Howard University Rankin Chapels has said something to us twice that I'll pass on to you. He said, the greatest obstacle to my discipleship is my ministry. The greatest obstacle to my discipleship is my ministry. Because ministry will get you confused on the road. Ministry will make you think that because you're showing up at church that you're worshiping. Ministry will make you think that because you cracked your Bible to write a sermon that you've got a devotional life with God. Ministry will make you think that because you're praying for people, that you're praying for yourself and that you're growing in God. Ministry will make you think that because your discipleship group is growing, that you're growing in your discipleship. And it's easy to get it twisted to think that because you work for the Lord, that you're growing close to the Lord. And that's the way Satan grabs us and gives us ungodly leaders because they've lost their discipleship and their Christianity to their ministry. So, so I come by to say to you, you, you ought to remember your name is written in heaven. Don't neglect your salvation. Remember that you got to worship too. Remember that you've got a reason to be thankful to God. And one of the saddest things to ever witness in church are folk who now, because they have a title and a pew, they sit like a statue through all of worship because now they've got a big title and they can't worship and praise God like they ought to. So I tell the 80 y'all and the 80 y'all, the first ones that ought to stand up and give God glory the first ones that ought to wave a hand are those who know that the grace of God called you out of where you were and put that title on your name. Don't, 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 don't let me catch you sleeping in church. Don't let me catch you just walking out early. If anybody ought to rejoice, if anybody ought to lead worship, it's those whom the Lord has called. Remember your worship. And remember that salvation only has power when you recognize that you ain't always been saved. Oh, God, I'm... Can I just preach now? It's a sad leader in church 
who thinks that a title in front of your name has erased the sin in your past and that you ain't what you used to be. Listen, I need you to recognize that it doesn't matter what your title is. Deacon, minister, bishop, preacher, elder, prelate, archbishop, pope, all of us are sinners and we are only saved by the grace and the goodness of our Lord. And if Jesus hadn't died for you, you'd still be on your way to hell with no reason to give thanks. So I thank God that I know I'm a sinner saved by grace. Don't, 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 don't. Listen, listen. Don't, 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 don't let that title make you think you're better than somebody. I come by and tell you, whatever your title is, you're still dirt. You may be deacon dirt. You may be minister dirt. I might be pastor dirt. But all of us are dirt saved by the grace of God. And no one's better. Remember your worship. Remember that you're still a sinner. Saved by grace. And remember that whatever you do, you've only done it by the grace and the power of God. They come back and at least they get this much right. They say, Lord, the demons are subject to us in your name. That, that if we didn't use your name, we couldn't have gotten anything done. If we didn't call on your name, our ministry would have fallen flat. If we didn't know the name of Jesus, there was nothing we'd be able to do. I couldn't do it in my name. I couldn't do it in my pastor's name. I couldn't do it in my church's name. But when I call on the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who sits high and looks low, the God who makes ways out of no ways, the God who hears and answers prayer. The God who died on the cross and on the third day rose again. That when I call on that name, demons shake and trip. When I call on that name, the sick are revived. When I call on that name, souls are saved. I do it all in the name. So I give God the glory. It's because of his name. Not your master divinity. Not your deacon degree on the wall. But because of the power of the name of Jesus. Don't rejoice in all this, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. <laughs> Whenever someone is ordained in our Baptist custom according to the word of God, we confirm it by the laying on of hands. By the laying on of hands on these ordinance, we acknowledge the special and unique call of God on their life. We receive them as servant leaders in our church. They are granted the right now to handle the elements and the ordinances of our church, the holy ordinance of baptism and the holy ordinance of the Lord's Supper. So what I'm going to ask you, in order to facilitate this decently and in order, I'm going to ask first and foremost that the deacons of our church family, those ordained deacons would come and surround these our ordinance and lay the hands on them. It is a passing on of that which we have received. And by chance, we also have deacons from other churches. I know that there are deacons who we welcome from Zion Baptist 
to celebrate with Brother Vernon and others. I'm going to invite them, if they so desire, to come as well with us for the laying on of hands. If you would leave room up here, I'm going to ask the deacons from Zion if they would come up on this side. Vernon is right down here. If you all come up this way um, to the side here, you'll get access to Vernon. Yes. Thank you. The Reverend Dr. Rosalind Brock will come forth and lead us in our prayer of ordination. As we stand now with the laying on of hands, we are doing as we have been instructed in Acts, the sixth chapter and the sixth verse, which states when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Church, let us also extend our hands towards those who will serve in leadership for this church. Heavenly and most gracious Father, since the time of the apostles, you have inspired the church to commission certain members to assist and to serve in a certain way in the pastoral mission of Christ. We rejoice in what you have done in the lives of these men and women ordained this day as deacons. Our passionate concern, Lord, is that you will use them way beyond their highest expectations. But Lord, that they just won't rejoice in the title, but know that it's about the work and it is about you. Lord, we know that you are able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, but only according to the power that works within us. And so now, Lord, we pray that you will bless and use these deacons to your glory, that they draw deeply from your rich, your rich, your rich well of grace. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you have provided faithful and gifted people to serve this church as deacons. And, O oh Lord, as they assume their responsibilities, we ask this church, we ask that you fill them with your spirit, endow them with your wisdom, and grant them strength. But, O oh Lord, most of all, make them faithful workers in your vineyard. For it is only under your guidance that this church will continue to grow in every spiritual grace in faith that is open and unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you to help them to perform their duties with enthusiasm, but also with humility. And their work grant them a sense of sustained awe, which is rooted in the daily adoration of you. Help us, Lord, your people, to accept them gladly and not be a pack of wolves that seeks to destroy their faith and their ministry that you have so ordained. Lord, we seek to encourage them always. We ask that you will give us the capacity and the ability to respect them and to pray for them. It is in this prayer, O oh Lord, that we give it to your Son, our Lord, and it is in your name that is above every name that we pray. We ask all of this, Lord, as we lay hands on these, your servants, who will continue to walk worthy of the vocation for that you have called. It is in our prayer. Let the church say, Amen.
The reception, you all may be seated, the reception of deacons into the church is not simply an ordination upon them, but a relationship that we form with them as a church family. One of the things we share with them in their training program is that being ordained a deacon has a limited exposure to the church in which you are ordained in. They are not a deacon at Zion. They're not a deacon at Ebenezer. They're not a deacon at Emmanuel. When they leave Alfred Street, they leave the title deacon right where they got it. Um, it is a relationship that they form with the church. And therefore, as a church family, we are also charged to welcome and receive them. And to grant that charge to us it is my great pleasure to bring and present back for this church family a man who's been a friend to me, been a friend to this church, who for years has labored in the vineyard at First Baptist in Vienna and has served as a moderator and a state president for our Baptist faith, teaches Baptist polity, has led the ordination training of Dr. Uh, Judy Finches Williams and Reverend Laura White. Won't you please welcome the Pastor Emeritus of the First Baptist Church of Vienna, the Reverend Dr. Kenny Smith, who comes at this time. First, give an honor to God to Dr. Wesley. Uh, I'm encouraged by your mess, brother. I feel like going on myself. Hallelujah. Um, I feel like uh, Queen Sheba uh, when she went to see about Solomon and all that was going on and, and what she had heard about what Solomon was doing. And she got there and she saw for herself. And she said, the half has not been told. I want to commend Dr. Wesley for a tremendous uh, ministry that he's doing here at the Alfred Street Baptist Church. Hallelujah. And I intend to keep up the rumor that he's kicking up a little dust here in, in, in the Alexander area. Hallelujah. My job is to uh, charge the church. And I don't know if Dr. Wesley know, but I served as about 10 years as a deacon. So I have a tremendous affinity for deacons. And I contend that the deacon is an extension of the pastor's ministry. The deacon uh, is to perform ministry uh, with the pastor. The function of the pastor and deacons are different but complementary and that things run much smoother when the pastor and the deacons stay in their lane. Uh, uh, the church runs smoothly when each the pastor and the deacon stay in their lane. Uh, I'm convinced that the deacons are a tremendous gift to the church. And uh, I want to suggest the, to the members of Alpha Street Baptist Church that you have a responsibility to these new deacons and the licentuants. And I want to lift up five, seven, uh, since I drove all the way from Haymarket, I was going to give you five, but I'm going to give you seven. Uh, seven things that you need to do very quickly, and I'm going to take my seat. The first thing that you need to do uh, after Street Baptist Church, these new deacons and licentuants, is that you need to pray for them. Uh, if they ever needed prayer, they surely need it now. Because as soon as they go downstairs, somebody going to tell them, man, you made it. Sister, you made it now. You're a deacon in Afro Street Baptist Church. So what? Uh, you need uh, a dollar and whatever it is when you go to Starbucks to get coffee. You can't tell them you're deacon in Afro. They don't care. Uh, so that, that don't mean nothing. So they, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for them that, as the pastor was indicated, that the, these wolves and all of that won't get next to them. They need prayer. That's, that's the first thing they need. Secondly, you need to permit the deacons to help you. Um, uh, the pastor can't make every uh, anniversary, every time you stump your toe, every time you go to hospital, every time you have an anniversary, the pastor can't make that. You need to let the deacons come, and when the deacons come, they're coming in the name of the pastor. And uh, 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 so you shouldn't be looking for the pastor. I've already told him he's going to kill himself trying to preach four sermons. Uh, uh, but, I, but he did pretty good today. I don't know what they did for him early in the, day, in the morning, but he, he, he don't seem to be tired uh, this afternoon. Uh, but, 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 but when the deacons come, they have come in the name of the pastor. And so when they come, 
you should uh, permit them to help you in terms of whatever you, you have going. So first of all, you need to pray for them. Second, you need to permit them to serve in the capacity in which you have installed them now. Secondly, you need to promote them. Uh, that is, you need to esteem them uh, as spiritual leaders and honor them and respect them. Because if you don't respect them, nobody else will. And so when they come uh, and they need to live a life in which would garner your respect, but you need to give them respect and promote them uh, uh, in terms of the position that you now have put them in. Uh, number four, you need to protect them. Uh, you need to protect them. And that is, uh, they are going to become deacons now, and there are going to be some wolves who have uh, a different kind of spirit, and it may not be holy. And they're going to call them over to the house, and uh, they're going to call them somewhere. They're going to hold them in some little corner after the service is over, and the trustees and everybody's left, and they want to hold them in some corner to talk to them. Well, that sister who knows that sister who's trying to hold you in a corner, they need to protect you and come and get you out of that corner, tell you to go home with your wife or go home wherever you need to go. Right? <laughs> Hallelujah. You need to protect them. Uh, hallelujah. Because, cause see, they, they're going to be like me sometimes. Sometimes I was at First Baptist. Don't you tell them I told you. I was at First Baptist. And and lady was coming and telling me things. Well, I, you know, I'm thinking we're doing ministry. Uh, but one of the older sisters pulled me to the corner and said, Pastor, that's not ministry. Hallelujah. You need to protect them. And the same thing for the men go for the ladies. Hallelujah. Because there are some men wolves out there. Hallelujah. You need to pray for them. You need to protect. You need to permit them to work. You need to promote them, protect them. And you need to be patient with them. They, are, they have just started their ministry, and they are not going to be like a seasoned deacon. Uh, they don't, may not know all the scriptures. Uh, they may not know all the things and the way the protocols and things that need to be done. So you need to be patient with them until they can grow into whatever it is uh, that the Lord has for them. And then you need to be, make them your primary source of information. In other words, if you hear something going on in Alfred Street, you don't need to be calling everybody. Call your deacon. Your deacon ought to know what's going on in the church. You need to call Sister Joan. You need to be called the choir director. You need to be called no trustee. If you hear something that you know that's inconsistent with what you know the principles of Alpha Street stand for, call your deacon. You need to call the pastor. It's seven, I have heard, 7,000 and growing. Can you imagine 7,000 you call in Wesley? He'd be crazy. And we need that brother to keep his mind so he can continue to preach like he's preaching a while ago. All right? Pray for them. Uh, permit them to work for you. Promote them. Protect them. Be patient. Let them be the primary source of your uh, information about Africa Street Baptist Church. And finally, uh, you need to praise them. You need to find a way in which every now and then you can say something nice about your deacon. You know, they don't get no salary. They're doing this voluntary. And so every now and then you need to find a way in which you can uh, say something nice to them. Uh, if they didn't know, if they, they're messing up, uh, say that the hair look nice or the shoes look nice. Find something nice to say about them. Um, I remember somebody said, I remember this lady at First Baptist. Don't tell nobody I told you. Uh, uh, this lady at First Baptist, they were doing something nice for me. I can't remember what it was. And uh, I think it was having an anniversary or something. And she said, she, she, you know, people say things, they don't say it to you in the face, it says you can hear it. I, I heard of what she said. She said, uh, he don't need nothing. We don't need to be nice to him. He going to get his when he get to heaven. That's what she said. So I turned around with all the Holy Ghost I could muster. And uh, I said to her, sweetheart, when I get to heaven, I don't need no praise from you. So they need to the praise here while they're on, on the ground. I'm going to ask all the Afro Street members if you please stand real quick. Do you, the members of Afro Street Baptist Church, acknowledge and receive these deacons 
entering with them into the spirit of, and vow they have made to God in this church? Do you promise to honor them, encourage them, cooperate with them, and pray for them according to the word of God and the constitution of this church admonishes, admonishes that you will do? If you will, say, I do. You are now officially charged to work with these deacons and these licentious in the ministry here at Afro Street Baptist Church. God bless you. You may be seated. The office of deacon originated in the selection of seven men by the apostles, among them Stephen, to assist with the charitable work of the early church as recorded in Acts 6. A woman, Phoebe, is also mentioned in Romans 16, 1 through 2, as a deacon of the church. Looking at them as examples, the expectations of the office of a deacon are fourfold. One, to be servants to the faithful. Two, to be defenders of the faith. Three, to be evangelists who share the faith. And four, to be standards before others as they live their faith. Servant. Just like the seven men who were appointed servants in the Church of Jerusalem, you too have been called to be servants of the Alfred Street Baptist Church. Now a servant is a waiter, an attendant, one who runs errands and does menial duties concerning the temporal things of the church. Today, you are being set aside as a diaconos servant. Be aware of the task set before you. The Lord has placed you here in this office. Therefore, serve it in a humble mindset. In John 13, we find that Jesus knew that the Father had put, him, put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer garment, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had wrapped around him. Here we see the Lord of glory humbling himself and washing the feet of his disciples just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many, so have you been called to serve. Your tasks will be many, the very least of which is sitting on the front pew of this church, or in the overflow rooms, preparing and serving communion, helping with candidates for baptism, or receiving new members for right hand of fellowship. That's the easy part. That's the visible part that the church sees. It's what the church doesn't see that is the real work. Because the church is made up of people in this world, your duties will involve helping people to deal with the things of the world. Sickness and health, birth and death, loss of a job and helping to find another one, eviction and homelessness, housewarmings, elder care, marriage and divorce, and its fallout, loneliness, substance abuse, and other secular, non-spiritual, and mundane activities of this world. But it also means involvement in your discipleship group projects, great fellowship gatherings, praying together, and inheriting a whole lot of new people in your family who will look up to you trust you to speak up for them and have their best interests at heart. Deacons are men and women appointed to serve others with a humble, willing, and able attitude. Servanthood means putting others before you. Your mantra should be, here I am, Lord. Use me for your service. I charge you as deacons to be servants of Alfred Street Baptist Church. Defender, just like Stephen, there will be times both at the church and outside of the church in which you will be put in the situation of defending the faith. That you will be required to take a stand concerning the reality and truth of God's word. 
there will be some who will put tradition or on the other hand, what's trending over and above the truth of God's word. When that happens, you will be required to be a defender of the faith. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense for everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. I charge you, deacons, to be defenders of the faith. Evangelists, as a deacon, you must be open to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and be willing to share the gospel with others as the Lord opens up opportunities to you. Carry out the Great Commission with Jesus and with others. I charge you, deacons, be evangelists, share your faith. Lastly, standard. The standards for deacon are laid out in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, and Timothy chapter 3. Acts 6, 3 says, states, brothers and sisters, choose those among you who are known to be full of spirit and wisdom. 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13 states, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. They are to be trustworthy in everything. You have been examined, have been found to be men and women of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and have been recommended to be ordained today to the office of deacon. You need to realize that you will now be living in a glass house. Amen. Both you and your spouse need to conduct your lives openly and candidly before others. Deacons are expected to be models of commendable faith and help other church members with their own faith. Live your life so that others will want to imitate your Christian walk. I charge you as deacons to be standards before others. In conclusion, deacon elects to the Alfred Street Baptist Church. You will now be known as Deacon Ethan Carr, Deacon Vernon Hammett, Deacon Anthony Howard Sr., Deacon Musetta Tia Johnson, Deacon Curtis Nash, Deacon Dwayne Reed, Deacon Frank Russell, and Deacon Kendall Thomas. To the Lord, however, you will now be his deacons, known as servants, defenders, evangelists, and standard bearers. These are all great titles, and I know that you will wear them well. Therefore, deacons elect, I now charge you before the body of witnesses that you serve your office well. For those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. Good afternoon. It is mine to formally welcome you new deacons into the diaconate here at Alpha Street Baptist Church along with our pastor. We know that you are well trained and well prepared for the journey that lies ahead of you. And as a matter of fact, it reminds me of a movie I just saw called Glory, old movie. You all remember it is about the 54th Battalion Regiment of colored soldiers from Massachusetts that were entered into the Civil War. In the scene that I saw, Private Trip, played by Denzel Washington, is just called out for special honor because of the battle they just won. Colonel comes up to him and says to him, I want you to carry our flags into the next battle. Denzel says, I don't want to carry your flag because I'm not quite sure that I understand what this war is going to mean for us black folk when it's all over. So the colonel says to him, well, what should we do? How do we fix this problem? And what he told him, and I'm going to tell you is, ante up and kick in. That's what we're called to do. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. We don't know if, in fact, we're going to win this war 
on this side of glory. But what we do know is that God has given you all that you need to ante up and kick in. Later on in that same scene, they go into the next battle, Fort Wagner, where they're trying to take this beach. And as they're walking past this regiment of white soldiers, soldier calls out to them and says, give them heck, 54. Ain't quite say heck. <laughs> give them heaven, 15. That's what your charge is. Give them heaven. Pastor? Come on up. Let's would stand up, please. I have to confess to you that I do know a few things about twos, for you see, I grew up on a farm, and on a farm you had to have many twos, a vast array of twos to carry out the daily tasks and responsibilities on the farm. So we're going to present you with some twos that you will need uh, as servants leaders. Not only are we going to present you with the twos, we're going to present you with the right twos for the job. Well, I remember at six years old when I attacked a Phillips screw with a flathead screwdriver. It just didn't work. So we want to present you with tools today that are going to assist you in carrying out your assignment here at the Alfred Street Baptist Church. The first thing I would like for you to do is to remove your deacon and training badge. This deacon and training badge that you're removing symbolizes the fact that you were in training here at Alfred Street, but now you have graduated. And so we're gonna replace your deacon and training badge with your official deacon's badge. As you wear that badge, remember, uh, it has something imprinted on it that you cannot see. As a deacon, that badge has printed on it and every member will see the words, ask me, for I'm a deacon. <laughs> so wear it proudly and be prepared to respond to any questions that might come your way. The next gift that we'd like to, or tool we'd like to present to you is your Bible. Timmy would say, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has need to be ashamed, rightfully handling the word of truth. Rely on this infallible document. It's complete, it's authoritative, it's sufficient, and it completes and accomplishes every promise that God makes in it. So carry your Bible with you constantly as American Express would say to you, don't leave home without it. The next thing we'd like to present to you are your communion gloves. Your communion gloves. Your communion gloves are important because we would expect you to wear them during every communion service here at Alfred Street and at other occasions as well. These gloves are white, symbolizing purity. White is also one of the colors that we wear at our two ordinances ordinance of communion and the ordinance of baptism. Wear your white gloves on these occasions. The kit, the communion kit, will prepare you to carry out communion services to anyone that you meet. Uh, the services that you provide those who are sick and shut in, uh, those members of your group who cannot come to church, you will have a kit to take communion to them. The next item we'd like to present to you are your calling cards. Your calling cards are to be used to leave your trademark wherever you go. Remember, there are certain places we don't want to find these cards in. 
also as you carry out your duties and responsibilities as a deacon, please remember to leave your calling card so that members and others would know that you've been by to see them. And finally, we'd like to present to you your certificate of ordination. This certificate certifies and affirms that you have been called and ordained into servant leadership, having been chosen as one of good report, full of the spirit and of wisdom, and capable of using the office as well, has been set apart publicly to the office and to the work of deacon. This certificate grants you no special powers or privileges. It does not give you a parking space near the church. It may assure you of a parking space at 117 North Alfred Street. Remember, deacons, God called you for a time such as this to serve the Lord by conducting the caring ministry of the church, by doing the work of benevolence, visiting the sick, being alert to the spiritual needs of the congregation for the purpose of freeing the pastor to focus on prayer and ministry of the word, promoting unity within the church, and facilitating the spread of the good news. May God bless you and congratulations.